And Emily, please feel comfortable to take over. Awesome. Um, thank you everyone so much for coming. Um, as Kristen mentioned, my name's Emily Siles and I am the Assistant Director for Career Development here at RPI. Um, part of my role is serving as the liaison for School of Engineering. And so I work alongside with my coworkers, Lindsay and Kristen. Um, and so the three of us uh, really serve the School of Engineering students. In particular, I tend to see a lot more electrical and computer and systems engineering students, um, but you will have the capability to meet with any of us here in the school, um, here in the CCPD. Um, so as Kristen mentioned as well, I'm just gonna give a brief overview um, of some of the hiring statistics for RPI alum in who graduated from the ECSC department. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so every year we do a survey for um, stu RPI students who have graduated to answer on what their next steps were in terms of graduation. Did they go on to graduate school? Did they get employment? If they did get employment or graduate school, where are they going to graduate school or where are they employed? What is their role? And we also ask for salary information. And this is to best help our current students understand where they may be able to go to after graduation. Um, so I'm gonna share with you those uh, statistics from our survey. So here are just some examples of different employers that students within the ECSE department have gone to work for. Again, this is just a very small snapshot of, of places where our alum work. And so you can get your the complete list on the CCPD website. We have um, an entire section devoted to hiring statistics and you can view companies um, where students go to work for, and it's broken down by major. So you'll be able to see where um, electrical engineers have gone on to work, where computer and systems engineers have gone on to work, or if you think you might have interest in other companies um, as well, that is a full list that's there. So I've just picked four here, and I've given a little bit more information about that company, but we have students who've worked at Cisco Systems, General Dynamics, Electric Boat, Ashcroft, IBM, and of course, there are um, some great alum here today who can talk to you about where they have worked in the past. Um, so this is just to highlight a few companies, like I said, um, just a snapshot of where some of our students go on to. Um, you know, a lot of these companies also come to career fairs or networking events. So this is a, those are great opportunities as well to engage with and learn about different employers in your field. We also have a lot of current opportunities for students. Um, if you haven't been on Handshake yet, which is our new career management system, I encourage you to do so because that is where we direct employers to be posting jobs, whether you're looking for full-time, internship, or co-op, we ask that all employers post a handshake. And so I went in on Friday and picked out, again, this is just a snapshot, I picked out some positions that would fit what ECSC students might be looking for. So there are, um, you know, electrical engineering full time positions um, and intern positions. There's interns locally at Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. There's, um, you know, internships at Sensata in Attleboro, Mass. Um, we also have some, you know, software interns at BAE Systems and then, you know, full time positions as a network systems engineer um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So there is a wide range of jobs being posted specifically within ECSC. And so, th again, this is just a snapshot and these are all current positions that are opening. Um, and I believe all of these internships that I found were actually for spring or um, some of them were summer as well. So recruiters are really now getting into that recruitment process for their summer internship. So it's a great opportunity to start looking. Um, so a lot of students ask about the you know average salary within their their major, what their what their earning potential could be. And so this is a snapshot of what students were reporting that their salary was from the job they were offered after graduation. For electrical engineers, the average salary that was offered was $70,400, with the entire range being $51,500 to $102,000. I did some further research by looking at the Bureau of Labor St St Statistics um, 
on uh, the median pay for 2019 for electrical engineers as a career. So these are engineers from all different, um, you know, levels, years of experience. Um, so this ranges the gamut from just starting out in the field to well seasoned professionals was 95,000, um, about $95,000. Um, so for computer systems, on average, RPI students who graduated with this major received um, a salary of $72,188. That was the average, with the range being $50,000 to $95,000. So this is really meant to give you a snapshot into earning potential, what you could be offered after graduation, um, and it just gives you more of an insight um, into the career field you might be interested in. So that's just a snapshot of some careers um, hiring statistics for the ECSE graduating alum, um, potentially in the field, but that's not all that the CCPD really does. Um, we're really here to support you as you're going through your career development journey and looking to have internships or full-time jobs. So before I kind of end, I just want to highlight some of the things that we can do for you um, on top of further exploring some of these statistics that I gave you as well. Um, you know, we can do career exploration, um, you know, talk a little bit more about the different careers that are open to you being in the ECSE department, right? Um, we can provide resume critiques, um, cover letter development, um, any application materials we can help you review. We can provide mock interviewing, review some salary negotiation. And I mentioned the idea of graduate school. So we do work a lot with students who are looking to go to graduate school after their undergraduate degree is received. Um, so we can help with the, you know, a suggested timeline, the application process, um, you know, the personal statements, as well as that mock interview process if that is required of your graduate school. So we're, we're really to help you, to help support you in where you are um, in terms of your career development. And again, you know, my name is Emily Siles. Um, I have my email up here, so please feel free to reach out at any time. Um, and again, myself, Kristen and Lindsay are liaisons for the School of Engineering. So I may have met with some of you on this call before, or if you've met with Kristen or Lindsay, they'd love to hear from you again. Um, and the best way to reach us right now, as we are completely virtual in the fall, um, is to make an appointment with your counselor through Handshake um, or email them directly if you have that contact information. But because we're not in the office, Handshake is the quickest way to see our availability and then reserve your time, um, you know, to be interacting with us over a, you know, a Zoom, you know, a WebEx call, a phone call, or we do, you know, email correspondence as well. Um, so. I don't know how much time we have, um, but I will open it up to questions. Yes, we do have like five minutes. So if anyone has any questions for Emily, either about her presentation or CCPD, um, feel free to put it in the chat and we can, um, we can address it there. Or if you feel brave enough and wanna unmute your mic for a second, you're welcome to do that as well. And while we're waiting for questions, um, I, if it, Kristen, you can interrupt me if a question, you know, comes up in the chat, but Handshake is another great resource um, as you're exploring some job, you know, career opportunities, occupational opportunities. Handshake is a great resource to do that. We, um, the Handshake is different than JobLink is that when companies sign up for Handshake, they actually create an entire profile and it gives a lot of detailed information about that company in particular as a whole. And so it focuses on, you know, what's their mission? What do they do? Um, what is the culture like at that company? You know, how big is that company? And then from there, any student across the, you know, the world who is a Handshake student whose school uses Handshake is able to go in and um, actually review that company from their own experience, right? So say a uh, student interned there and they want to tell other students about it. There's the ability to go in and do that. And there's also the ability to see interview information. Um, so if you're preparing for an interview, you can go in and look at this company profile and see some examples of the types of questions that were asked in previous interviews. And it's just meant to help you prepare. It's not a guarantee you'll get asked the same 
questions, um, but it's a great way to just get more information. Additionally, you can follow certain companies. And so what that will do is if you follow a company you have a great interest in, you will actually get email updates on when they post positions. If you've saved a position that they've posted and the application deadline is coming up, you will also get an email letting you know that that's coming up. So that's a great feature as well to kind of keep you up to date with what companies are doing, what jobs they're posting, and what other, you know, what other students' experiences are within that company. So I just wanted to kind of highlight one of that feature on Handshake because it could be useful as you're looking into some of your different career options and where you see yourself in the future to help provide you some information about companies within the ECSC industry. And it looks like we have one question here. Um, let me read it for you. Okay. How many companies are on Handshake? Are they big slash well-known companies or mostly smaller companies? That's a great question. Um, to be honest, I don't have the exact number for you. It is a lot. Um, our employer relations team is in charge of managing the companies that sign up, but I can tell you it runs the gamut from very, very well-known companies to very, very small companies. So the other thing about Handshake is it's not, so yes, there are companies that are looking to recruit at RPI, but think of companies like you know, Google, BAE Systems, Cisco, these larger companies that do a lot of recruiting at colleges, they all also have company profiles that's open to all of Handshake. So there are those companies that are open to any student who has access to Handshake. And then there are the companies that recruit with, you know, RPI and might be more small and local. So it really is kind of a good mixture of both. Um, I have not yet heard of a student looking for a company and not finding the company profile, um, especially for those larger well-known companies. Most likely they will be on Handshake. Awesome, thank you so much, Emily. You're welcome. Um, it looks like we don't have any more questions and we are just on time to switch gears. Really, really appreciate you hanging out with us this evening to give us that information. Thank um, you. Just to reiterate what you said, um, one of the reasons that we're so excited that Emily can join us and her <laughs> colleagues, Kristen, which I know is confusing because I'm also Kristen. <laughs> um, and, uh, oh shoot, I had a total mind blank. Lindsay. Lindsay, holy, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> um, I did not wake up able to speak today. Um, but one of the reasons we're so excited that they get to join us for uh, industry hour is so that you can see their faces and connect to them and know that there are lovely, kind, warm people in our career center. So no matter what stage you're at, you can start having that conversation, um, even if you haven't decided your major yet. Uh, and for those of you who have decided your major, obviously, it's never too soon to get started, um, even if it's just exploring. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to turn the reins over to my wonderful colleague and friend, Kara. Kara is the advisor for ECSE um, in the School of Engineering Hub, and she is going to uh, conduct the panel with everyone. Kara, all yours. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. I definitely see some familiar names on the screen here, which is exciting. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kara Leaf, and I am the advisor in the School of Engineering Advising Hub for Electrical and Computer Systems Engineering. So if you ever have any questions about the curriculum, what classes to take, things like that, I'm your person to go to. Um, some popular dual majors that we have in the department would be both electrical and computer systems. So if you hear everyone on here talking about their field and you feel like you just can't choose, well, you don't have to. And then we also have a lot of students who do computer systems and computer science. So if you're interested in programming, but have the worry that you wouldn't be able to get enough of that software background in the School of Engineering, that could potentially be a really good option for you. But either way, that is enough about me because the people you guys are here to see are our wonderful panel. So. Basically, we are going to take a moment and go down and have everybody take two minutes to just introduce themselves, say hello, so you know who you'll be hearing from, and then we'll dive a little more into detailed questions after that. 
So to start us off, can we hear a hello from Diane? Hi, everyone. Great to be with you all tonight and talk about engineering and work experiences. Um, as mentioned, I'm, I am Diane Howard, and I retired several years ago from Northrop Grumman as VP of their then cyber division. And if you're not familiar with Northrop Grumman, they are a global defense and security company. Um, and during my time there, I had a wonderful opportunity to work across a myriad programs in both the business development predominantly and also in operations capacity. And my roles um, involve programs that span the gamut from advanced communication systems, reconnaissance, intelligence systems, um, surveillance systems. And my customer was the Department of Defense, federal agencies, and international um, allies. And I worked for 34 years, so I think I'm the senior member of the team here um, and retired. And I worked in both the commercial sector and the defense industry. And I actually started out my career as a computer design engineer for, for IBM. And I'm talking to you today from sunny Sarasota, Florida, but my hometown is Binghamton, New York, which is just a couple hours southwest of, uh, hey, I see a hand raise, Kara, a couple hours southwest here um, down, uh, I think, uh, down, the, down the interstate. And um, I graduated in 1982 with a degree in electrical engineering. And I don't know if you can see this. This is me in 1982, and I'm standing there with my twin sister graduated with a degree in biomedical engineering and I also have two older brothers that graduated from Rensselaer so um, RPI runs once through our veins for sure. I later went on to get my master's degree from Syracuse University in computer engineering and um, as I mentioned I'm fully retired but I remain a staunch advocate for STEM and continue to volunteer for Rensselaer with the annual fund as a way to give back as uh, uh, RPI afforded me some great opportunities so I really like to really like to give back. Awesome, thank you so much. And next, can we hear from Dr. Galarza? Oh, I think you're still muted. Can you hear me now? Perfect, thanks. My name is Ricardo Galarza. Amazingly enough, I have a twin brother who is also uh, an electrical engineer, and I just heard the answer in that. And I, well, anyway, it was something interesting. Um, I am originally from Argentina. I did my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering there. Um, and then I did a master and PhD in electric power engineering at RPI. And this is not a cliche. It was a dream of mine. And I was so, so, so happy when they accepted me because we knew about RPI even there. You know, in South America, we knew about RPI, we knew about some professors, and it was a dream for me. Um, I started my, of course, I started my career in Argentina doing work for a, a utility company. And, but I only had this hunch that I wanted to do graduate school. They didn't have graduate school there. So I started looking and I said, okay, I want to go this place. But you, you are not ever so lucky that this place is going to accept you. So I applied to many places and this place, RPA, accepted me. So I was very happy, as I said. Um, I st after graduation, after the PhD, I started working for a consulting firm uh, in Schenectady, New York. And we did power system analysis, power system planning operations. And six years later, I was, um, I wanted to change a little bit my career. I took on the electricity markets. And so when they just implemented the electricity markets in New York, uh, it was a great experience because everything was new. And I was able to do what I wanted with my resume. Uh, after that, one day, I just had a hunch I wanted to do consulting on my own. And that's what I'm doing now. My company is called PSM Consulting, as in Power System and Market Consulting. And there is where I work now. Great, thank you. 
All right, and next up we have Niranthi. Hello. Um, hi, I'm uh, I'm Niranthi Ramaswamy, and uh, I am a junior dual majoring in electrical engineering and computer and systems engineering. And I'm originally from Piscataway, New Jersey, and I look forward to talking to you all about my internship experience in this panel. Thank you. Uh, so good to see the upperclassmen again. All right, and next we have Dr. Kaminini. Hi, I'm Himani Kaminini. Um, I was born in India, but I've been in the States for most of my life. So, and most of it actually in New York. So I'm a pure New Yorker at heart. Um, I earned my dual bachelor's in, in electrical engineering and computer and systems engineering. So what Car had mentioned earlier, ECSC. And um, after that, I went to grad school for my master's and my PhD in silicon photonics at uh, CNSE, which is in Albany. It's College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering. And once I graduated there, I actually joined Global Foundries, which is a chip maker or semiconductor uh, fabrication facility in um, Malta, New York, so just in the Saratoga area. And currently, I'm actually part of a silicon photonics-based quantum computing startup in the Bay Area. It's called SciQuantum. And um, I'm there, I'm the director of packaging, so advanced packaging. Basically, you have the silicon, you have the chips that you see in your phones and things, but how do you get them to that form? Um, so I lead their advanced packaging efforts. And due to COVID, it's kind of interesting. My whole team and my residence actually is in California, but my family um, and my network is in New York. So we came for the summer, but because of COVID, we're actually just extending our stay. So I'm kind of a by coastal uh, employee at the moment, um, but really enjoying it here back in New York. Great, thank you. Next up, we have Sam Atkinson. Hello, um, yeah, I'm Sam Atkinson. Um, I am originally from York, Pennsylvania, um, and I graduated in 2018 uh, with a dual major in computer systems, engineering and computer science. Um, I have been working at Amazon Web Services since I graduated in 2018. Um, I work on, for those that don't know, the Amazon Web Services is the, the cloud computing um, sort of division of Amazon.com. Um, we offer, you know, cloud computing services to, to individuals and enterprises. Um, and I'm on a, a service team at, at uh, Amazon Web Services that vends uh, large scale file systems um, to our customers. So. Um, yeah, I look forward to talking more about that and internships and experience. Great. And last but not least, let's hear from Matt. Hi, I am Matthew Dennerline. I'm uh, from North Jersey, and I'm currently a senior in computer systems engineering. And I got a really great opportunity to work over at Nokia Bell Labs, which is also in New Jersey, it happens to be like a minute away from my house, which is great. And I worked there for the last eight months as a digital hardware design engineer. And I'm actually still working for them uh, as a contractor now that I'm back at RPI full time. But uh, yeah, I look forward to talking about it some more in the later parts of this. Great. So now that we have heard a quick hello from all of our panelists, we're gonna dive into some more specific questions. So this first question is for all of the panelists. So I guess for the sake of simplicity, maybe we'll go in order of introductions. So Diane, Ricardo, Yantri, um, Himani, Sam, and Matt. So for the first question, what originally made you choose your major or a dual major if that applies to you? And additionally, for the alumni on our panel, how did you further decide what specific part of the field you wanted to focus on? So for example, some of you in power systems, some in packaging, since we know that fields like electrical and computer systems can go a lot of different ways. So let's start with Diane. Okay, great. Well, you know, for me, it's pretty simple. You know, back in 1982, uh, if you were math or science oriented, the, the choices were generally laid out for you were, were electrical, mechanical, or chemical engineering, because at that time, that was really where the market opportunities were. Um, and they were in demand in the marketplace. And, and, and honestly, and I'm gonna be very candid with you, I kind of chose electrical engineering somewhat capriciously. I, um, I knew there were opportunities if I made it, to, made it through and, and graduated, 
Um, but I also, um, my older brother was a mechanical engineering major, so I wasn't going to do that. My sister was a biomedical engineer. I wasn't, I wasn't going to do that. Um, and so I, I, I I went the path of electrical engineering because it was hard, it was challenging, and I could have great opportunities. But for me, where my focus shift, interestingly enough, was, um, and again, I think we didn't have the opportunities that you all in terms of this SOE hub and really being able to explore the different aspects of these disciplines. But as I went through my course of study, one uh, course really, really spoke to me. And at the time it was called Computer Organization and Logic Design. And I loved it. I was good at it. And so I said, hey, this is this is what I want to do. And I wanted I want to design computers. So in hindsight, it probably would have been better for me to be an uh, ECSE major. But that said, you know, this course kind of laid it out for me. And fortunately, I had the opportunity then, you know, when I when I started it as a graduate to um, get into computer design engineering for IBM. Great. And then next, let's go to Dr. Galarza. Um, I also did electrical engineering at the beginning. And for me, it was kind of simple. I have a very good friend of my father who was an engineer. And my father was of the idea that you had to shadow people, go with them, spend some time with them. And this guy was very nice and took me, uh, you know, for, because I was very, I was a child when I decided that I was 16 years old. Um, so I didn't know if I would like it or not. I knew I liked physics. I knew I liked math, but I, but I like a lot of other stuff too. So I think he had a great influence. And when he mentioned once that it's all about problem solving, that just caught my attention. And I'm on the engineer and I wanted to do electrical for some reason. And at the end of the, in, in Argentina, at the end of the bachelor's degree, you have to do an internship in, in, in the industry. And it lasts six months. And I did the internship in the utility company. So, it was like one thing brought another. So when I finished the internship, I finished my degree. I asked the guy who was working there if he has, if he sees me working in any other area there. And he said, yes, I like you can work for us. And well, I lasted four years because I was very, not quiet, let's put it that way. So I was, I started looking for, for graduate school. And at that time, RPI was one of the few schools in the world that had a whole department separated only for power engineering. And as I said before, I knew the guys, the professors. We read their books. So it was like, okay, if I want to do power system engineering, if they accept me, I'm going there. And so that basically, put me in a, in a concentration in the power system engineering that it is, in my views, a little bit too much. I consider that, maybe we'll talk about that later, that you have to be exposed to some other stuff, but uh, I concentrated all of it in, in power system. So that is my, my story, and, you know? Uh, that's the way I ended up um, Doing in, in in the title it says master on science in electric power engineering. It doesn't say electrical engineering. It was a separate department. Unfortunately, we don't have that anymore. But um, as I said, that is my story, and um, it's very concentrating one thing only. Although the industry offers you a lot of possibilities. Great, thank you. All right, Niantri. So I've always known that I have wanted to be an engineer some way or the other, but I think what solidified like my path was when I was in the robotics team back in high school, where I really, really loved what I did, which was being part of the electrical team and the programming team. 
but I could really not choose between my love for software or my love for hardware. I love both and I just didn't know what to do. So when I decided to apply to colleges and when I did come to RPI, I knew I was not ready to choose yet. So therefore I chose to dual major in electrical engineering and computer and systems engineering. And I don't think I'm still ready to choose because I love both of them equally. But um, I had a chance in my internship to actually work on both sides of things. And the fa and one of the reasons why I wanted to like dual major was because of the wide variety of opportunities that dual majoring like presented to me. And therefore that's why I wanted to like take the path that I did. But I've still not chosen the concentration. Awesome. And actually, since you mentioned concentrations, I'm just going to quickly sidebar to tell the group. So if you choose a major in electrical or computer systems engineering, you don't have to declare a concentration if you don't want to. Like, even if you do, it's not going to be like written on your diploma. However, if there's a specific interest you have, whether it's something like robotics or electric power, the department has made up lists of classes that you can find on ECSE's website that show you all the different electives that can support that interest. So um, definitely nothing you need to worry about in your first year, but just know that that opportunity is there if it's something you become interested in. And now that my sidebar is over, um, over to Dr. Kamenemi. Sure. Um, I, my story is pretty straightforward too. Um, I have an older cousin who I ended up visiting, I think when I was in middle school, um, right before he was about to graduate with his doctorate. And um, his focus was on hardware design. And uh, then the following summer, uh, when I entered ninth grade, I visited him a year later in, in Intel in the Bay Area. And Intel has this really great museum in the first floor of their main facility. So I really got to see how the software side where you see the binary, the zeros and ones and the, how it's led to the different coding languages and things and how that's integrated with the hardware, the silicon side of things or the chips that we're seeing you know, in our day-to-day -day lives. So I'm a very visual person. That's why I like engineering. I like to be very hands-on and see what I'm designing and making. Um, so seeing how the hardware and software function together to basically digitize our lives was pretty exciting. And then um, in my, I think for the second part of the question about you know, how I chose packaging and things, um, in my junior and senior year at RPI, I was pretty interested in nanotechnology. And uh, those summers, I actually interned at IBM in Vermont, and my manager there actually made me aware of, uh, you know, the College of Nano Skill Science in Albany. And the reason I went to um, go there because I applied at Cornell and a lot of these other very like strong, robust, you know, engineering schools, is that CNSC was like the first fully nanotechnology-based graduate program that partnered with on-site industry consortium members. So. It was actually like, you know, you're doing your research, but you're badging in and working alongside research partners. So it's already kind of a transition from going from academia to getting your graduate degrees, but then also already being a part of the industry. So when I um, graduated from CNSC, it was my transition to Global Foundries into like the real world or the working environment was very seamless. Um, and just being able to work with partners and um, being aware of, you know, not just kind of being locked in my lab. There were days I kind of had to do that, but um, uh, being able to kind of focus on silicon photonics and then, you know, transition to advanced packaging and how do I handle, um, you know, silicon photonics and advanced chips and placements and things like that. Global Foundries was very seamless. So um, just the ECSC major and then transitioning to, you know, CNSC and then to Global Foundries, it just kind of flew very smoothly. Awesome. So next up is Sam. Yep. Um, I think my sort of introduction into engineering was also kind of common to the rest. Like I had family that was in engineering um, and I enjoyed like tinkering, you know, with electronics. And then I was lucky enough to be able to take um, some programming classes through um, through in high school. Um, so I knew fairly early that I wanted to do, you know, I wanted to work with computers in, in some way, shape, or form um, in my career. So I, I entered RPI as a computer engineer, computer systems engineering uh, major. And then I think about a year in, um, after taking, you know, some of the programming classes that you have to take fairly early, um, I decided that I wanted to, you know, concentrate on, on the software side. 
Um, and so I added a computer science uh, dual major. Um, and then on even you know further into that, um, I interned at Amazon Web Services where I currently work um, during my time at RPI um, and got to you know experience some of the the uh, requirements that they have around you know really robust systems um, and things that usually at RPI are usually um, uh, concentrated on in the in the engineering side of things. There's not a ton of uh, concentration on on building robust, maintainable systems in the computer science side. Um, I think that's common everywhere. Um, but I think focusing on you know having the, the uh, experience in both sides, both in you know obviously software, writing software, and then building systems that are maintainable and robust and you know can last for for decades, um, both have had a, a huge impact um, on on you know the start of my career. Um, yeah. Awesome. And then Matt. So um, mine as well is sort of similar to everyone else. So, um, you know, when I was going into college, I knew that I loved hardware, uh, specifically computer hardware for, you know, the logic design side of things. So that's so I knew that I was going to look at some sort of engineering. And, you know, as far as computers go, it's, uh, you know, it's very happy to see that RPI also has, you know, computer engineering major besides just electrical engineering. And, uh, you know, at the same time, besides just focusing on computer hardware, I also love to program. So it seemed sort of the natural choice to go with the computer systems engineering major. So uh, actually earlier, Diane mentioned a course, which was actually renamed to Computer Components and Operations. And that too uh, is one of the best classes that I've taken here. And it really reaffirmed my decision to stay as a computer systems engineer because it was a great course that really taught you, you know, how to design stuff with digital logic and, you know, using low level, uh, you know, integrated circuits to build, you know, complex systems. And uh, yeah, and you know, especially in my senior year now, I continue to take courses that you know I thoroughly enjoy, and you know, it's it's been very great for me. So yeah, so if you do like programming and you like computer hardware, I definitely think this is a great engine, uh, a great major for you. Awesome. Okay. So this next question will again be for everyone. Let's, but it'll be slightly different for our students versus our alumni. So let's start with the students. Um, and you guys can decide whoever wants to talk first, but could you guys briefly tell us about your internship experiences that you've referenced, kind of what your responsibilities look like day to day and what you've learned as a result of being able to do those things? I can go first. Um, so I was, um, I had, um, this is about my summer internship last summer. And um, I worked as an embedded software intern at Motorola Solutions, uh, which is based in Plantation, Florida. And uh, my responsibilities was to was basically coding for a feature on their uh, RF deck, which is a radio frequency deck. And Motorola Solutions actually um, manufactures two-way communication radios for first responders like um, police officers, EMT, and firefighters. So it was really nice, like it was really cool for me to like in a way serve the community and also like pursue my passion of, for engineering. And alongside the uh, software part of it, I also had a chance to work with the electrical engineering team on uh, designing a few chips for the um, RF deck on the radios too. And yeah, that was, basically what my internship was about. Great, and Matt? So I got to work at Bell Labs, which was um, you know, an awesome experience. I mean, uh, it's the birthplace of the transistor, so kind of like the, the father of modern uh, computer hardware, which was awesome. And they, they too have like a small museum and I, I really enjoyed, you know, being able to actually work there. And obviously with COVID, I only got like probably four or five months before I had to shift, uh, you know, working from home. But uh, yeah, so I was a digital uh, design hardware engineer. So I worked mainly with FPGAs. 
which is a field programmable date arrays, which is it's sort of like programming, but uh, lower level and you're designing hardware, not not code per se. And um, I worked on high performance equipment controllers for optical systems, which was mostly, you know, communication systems, you know, these incredibly fast, you know, five you know, terabits a second and, you know, figuring out how to demux it. It basically what, um, you know, modern day companies are using to uh, implement 5G communication networks. Um, another kind of side project, which was really cool, was I actually designed a PRNG, a true random number generator in hardware. And that was that was a really cool project. And it's currently um, going under a certification from the government. Because if you contract for the government, your hardware needs specific uh, you know, requirements in order to be used in government systems. So yeah, it's, it's been a great experience for me. And I'm very glad that I got the opportunity to do that. Wonderful. And so very similar question to our alumni panelists. Could you tell our students briefly what your day-to-day -day responsibilities look like or if you uh, are now retired or out of the day-to-day -day of what you used to do for most of your career, what it looked like in your part of the industry. Um, and we can go in any order, so why don't we switch it up? How about we start with Dr. Kamenini? Sure. Um, as head of packaging inside Quantum, um, we are a fabulous entity, we're a startup, and that basically means that all of the silicon or chip scale work that we do is actually done outside of our company and actually all the packaging work is actually done outside as well. Um, the only thing that we're really doing in house is of course all the design work and then doing the testing of those units. Um, but the rest of it involves a very global partner and vendor supply chain. And I think my team or my department has probably the most global environment. Everything we do is external. So this basically means that there's a lot of meetings to stay in sync with our supply chain and our partners. Uh, Pre-COVID, there was travel to kind of go and see the site, see the facilities, you know, audit them before we join in partnerships or choose them to be a vendor for us. Um, but now everything is kind of done, you know, remotely. Um, leading the department also means that um, I have a lot of internal meetings to align within, of course, within my team members. Now that we're all remote, we have to make sure that, you know, we're um, everybody's in sync and all their vendors and everything is in place, but then also with um, the other department heads. So we have testing them in house to align with them on you know, what our cues are, our priorities, uh, working with our C staff or executive teams to make sure that you know, our hiring, our budgets, our fiscal planning, all of this also is in place. Um, so it's now with COVID, it's really most of my day is spent in calls, connecting with internal team members, uh, and all the various internal organizations, as well as, you know, the vendor global supply chain. Um, in technical, like working sessions, what I am owning is the packaging strategy. What is a roadmap? So we are pushing things. Um, we're, we're always trying to do everything in, in a high volume manufacturing type environment. We don't want to make something as a startup that you can only build in a lab at one time. Um, so we really have to focus on what is our five year roadmap? How do we scale up? What are the prototypes we're building and how are we scaling those up? Um, but in parallel, there's a lot of people management uh, responsibilities too. So, you know, dealing with hiring, annual reviews, budgets, roadmaps, uh, working with our program managers that track all of our schedules and budgets and things. And the list kind of goes on. So every day looks a little different, but nowadays it's spent a lot in front of the computer. So I'm very glad I invested in kind of a standing desk because it was just all day of meetings. And um, I think that was really helpful. So. Great, and why don't we move on to Diane Howard? Great, well, um, Matt described really beautifully what it's like to be a de um, design engineer and some of those responsibilities. And my my work then is so so dated, I won't even go back to the IBM days of 1982. But what I would like to talk to you about is what I was doing before I retired. And as I mentioned, I spent most of my career as a business development executive working in the defense industry. And, and what, what that looked like on a day-to-day -day perspective was, was really interesting. And my job was essentially to win and secure new, new business for our company consistent with what we did. And I, as I mentioned before, that was anything from intelligence systems, network systems, um, uh, uh, communication, surveillance, reconnaissance, and, and so on. And, and the way we did that was I worked with a team of people 
that was multidimensional, multidiscipline, um, some technical, some were retired military, other subject matter expertise and other, other functional organizations. And essentially what we would do is work with customers, understand their budgets, look to help them refine their requirements and basically work back and forth through thought leadership culminating in proposals, which we would give to them. And, and, and hopefully we would discriminate, our, discriminate ourselves in a way against our competition and, 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 win, and win new business. And the type of work was, was generally very, very complex and required significant innovation, not only from a technical solution perspective, which is why we try to hire the best and brightest engineers, but also uh, trade-offs from an affordability and sustainability perspective. And this, again, getting back to collaboration and coordination, I had to work across a lot of multidiscipline teams to put the best uh, solution together that met budget and, and schedule uh, requirements. And for me personally, I had both an internal perspective or internal responsibility within the company and also an external focus. And, and, and what it came down was essentially this. For my internal uh, um, job requirements, if you will, I was responsible for getting contracts exceeding a billion dollars a year. And, and how I did that was essentially what I described previously, but also creating the environment with people, processes, and tools and clear lines of responsibility so our business engine could function and work efficiently. And from an external perspective, um, I had to work with customers from uh, strategic engagement, build credibility, and you know, try to bring the best solutions to bear. Again, I was one of a team of people working across multiple segments of the customer. The customer was not just one, one person. But to sum it all up, you know, what I'm describing to you is where maybe an engineering degree can take you, because what I described to you right then was not so much electrical engineering per se, but my um, double E foundation gave me a great start to leverage as I got into the executive ranks. Um, in terms of helping with trade-offs, being credible with customers, and, and so on. And, and quite frankly, I just I just love working with the defense industry. It was great, meaningful work, not only from working on cool projects, but also be able to create jobs uh, for, for people. Thank you. And why don't we move on to Dr. Galarza? As I was saying before, for me, the day-to-day -day, uh, responsibilities were very, very focusing one thing and one thing only. Either when I started in Argentina, it was all in a utility company. Then I come here, do the whole thing in power system again. And then I go to a company that is, did power system again, uh, specifically uh, studies you know, design of the system. We were not into telling you how tall the tower should be, but we were going to tell you how is the proper design to avoid blackouts, basically. So our whole purpose was to avoid blackouts. And after six years there, after I have a big talk with my twin brother, he was a, took a different path. And he, when he was 32, he was already in the world of director of a utility. So he has a very different idea of career path where he told me, why don't you open up your resume? And then I found an opportunity. They formed together a team of people, multidiscipline, in, in, in the company that runs the power system in New York. And it's called Independent System Operator. Um, Anyway, for three years, I was there with economists and lawyers every single day, economists and lawyers. I was the only engineer in a group of eight. So I had to learn a lot of things. I regret having done a lot of things in my youth. Maybe I should have taken this course or that course. It would have helped me handle this better. Maybe I should have taken more English or something like that, or communications, because I found very, very different the communication between two engineers and just another person, you know, another profession. So, uh, but still there was something that I didn't like. It. And it was the idea that 
we made assumption we study stuff in 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 power system and we don't say hey the lights are off we have a blackout and then they ask you why you say well because what i assumed was wrong and there is no consequence for that i found that some of the other people that were working with me will introduce numbers and they were to me what are, they were not that precise because you will say to them hey look at the number you gave me we are going in the right wrong direction man and they will say well the assumption didn't pan out in an engineer if the assumption that don't pan out a bridge collapse there is a blackout so it was a great experience in the sense of uh, opening my mind but i came back to my own love i said no, I really like power system engineering. I truly, truly love not seeing what I'm doing because I don't see any electromagnetic field. I don't, I don't see any voltage. I just compute them. And I kind of like that. I don't see anything of what I do. Actually, if I see it, it's because something went wrong. The lights are off. So in a daily basis, what I do is try to imagine what can go wrong when you change the operation of the system, when you change the structure of the grid, when you incorporate renewals to the grid, when you uh, operate the grid, try to uh, simulate uh, conditions that will prevent blackouts from happening. And with all the study we do, they still happen. Once in a while, but they still happen. And then they all remember <laughs> the power engineers. Uh, uh, so if you were to see my office here, I had humongous monitors because I have a huge map, electrical map on New York in one of them. A simulation is running in another one. And that's basically what I do. Simulations of the system could be a dynamic simulation, it could be taking a snapshot of the system and say, oh, there is something wrong here. Or uh, running something like, a, a, what is a credible uh, event that could end up in something wrong? The extreme of it is a blackout. So I call it studies in general. I call it analysis in general. But that's basically what I do most of the time, is simulations, simulations, simulations. Awesome, and then Sam. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Rita. Okay, Sam. Um, yeah, so I think, funnily enough, I have some things in common with with uh, what Ricardo did. A, a lot of um, what, what the cloud computing industry is today is um, designing systems that are, um, that can take a failure and, you know, keep moving on. Um, a lot of, you know, a ton of industry has now moved to the cloud. A lot of the internet is just, it's running through, you know, service like Amazon Web Services. So we have to, you know, imagine what can go wrong in, in every single, um, piece of infrastructure that we have from, you know, a cooling system going down in a data center to just, you know, a, a bit in, you know, memory flipping to the wrong, to the wrong thing. Um, and, you know, taking all of those possible failure modes and writing software that is written such that you can provably continue to move on um, and make progress and continue to serve your customers. Um, you know, so when, a, when a, the entire internet for a country goes down or when a data center an entire data center goes down, or just one computer loses a, um, you know, a disk. Um, how do you write software that that can handle that and continue to to move on? Um, so even as a you know just a, a software engineer with two years of experience, um, I think something unique about AWS is um, you know because there are so many services and so many people working on these individual services. My job often involves thinking of those failure scenarios and making sure that a piece of software that I'm working on related to our file system service is going to be robust enough to handle, you know, a large scale failure like that or a small scale failure um, and that, that things will continue to move for our customers. So 
a lot of my job day to day falls under that category of just operations and making sure that that things are still running the way they should be running um, and that they will continue to run the way that our customers expect them to run. Um, that moves on to, you know, like feature development, which I, I do. Um, I'm on a relatively small team of, of I think, 10. Um, and so I get to work on designing uh, some features and then implementing those features or being a, a feature lead or working on, you know, a feature for someone else as a lead um, and, and, you know, working through the design, iterating on that and making sure that, that things will, um, you know, be, be scalable, robust. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. I was, I was um, lucky enough to, to be able to join Amazon Web Services at a time when a lot of new features were, a lot of new services were, were in development. It's constantly happening, but um, at, at a company like this, a lot of times there's so much movement all the time that um, you can build something from scratch at a company that large, which is really exciting. So the, I, helped, I got to help build um, this file system service that we now offer that offers petabyte scale file systems to enterprises um, and smaller file systems for individuals, um, really high performance file systems. So um, just a lot of, a lot of opportunity, um, you know, to build something um, at, a, at a cloud computing company like this. That's, that's pretty much my, my day to day. Great. So for this next part, uh, we're going to kind of target the questions to some of your different experiences. So to start, Diane, your career took a really interesting progression through more business focused roles than some of our students might expect that they could go on to after engineering. So could you share a bit how that Diversion is the wrong word, but how that progression began and what value your degree provided, even as you went into a slightly more engineering adjacent type field. Sure. Yeah, as I mentioned, I started off as a computer design engineer for IBM, and I thought that was, you know, I just died and went to heaven. This is, this is what I wanted to do was at back then, IBM was the Apple, Google, Amazon of the day. It was just, okay, here's where I am. I landed, right? And so, where I, where things progressed was I was conscientious. I was really, really good at my job, but I was also noticed for other capabilities and they may be more nuanced from the standpoint of um, being a good team builder, um, sticking my hand up to do other hard assignments and, you know, uh, showing some leadership capabilities and not, not being too afraid to get out of my comfort zone. So, at 25, I got promoted to be a department manager, and now I was managing a team of engineers. And, and I will say I was actually terrified because it's like, I know how to be an engineer, but how do I manage engineers? And how do I manage, uh, and everybody's older than me. And so, so it, was, it was actually terrifying, although I tried not to let anybody know that. So, so this was the real inflection point for me to go from purely an individual contributor to now leading a team of engineers and, and having to leverage them to um, provide value for the business and to be able to help them grow and learn things from a more uh, business perspective. And, and I like that. So, you know, so there's a lesson there, kind of keep your eyes open for different possibilities that may, may hit you when you're, you know, when you least expect them. And so, so yeah, that was my, my inflection point. And so, you know, as I um, progressed into the executive ranks, um, I naturally veered farther and farther away from solving technical problems myself in an engineering capacity. However, my technical background was valuable in, in being able to build and mobilize teams of engineers, subject matter experts, and other functional skill sets to bring the best solutions to bear you know, for our customers. And as I mentioned, it was predominantly you know, military and uh, federal agencies. And kind in, in balancing, I'll call it the building the most exquisite solution with the trade-offs that have come naturally with um, the schedule, budget, affordability, um, and, and so on. And when I was working on some of those large scale systems, and as I mentioned, that was in a business development capacity in terms of bringing proposals for these complex system with systems and, and working with and collaborating with uh, multiple teams and, and, and different types of skill set, that you know, I found that having that um, technical degree also gave me a level of credibility with my customers. Because again, most of them are extremely sophisticated 
in terms of you know what they needed, not just operationally, but but the how, what kind of technologies they wanted, what you know, what did they want it to look like. And so, you know, so that was a, a good, um, you know, again, a good skill set to have. And and so for me, really, the, the bottom line is that, you know, yes, I have an electrical engineering degree, and, and I look at it and back in the rear view mirror and just say, well, that was a, a great set of credentials to think critically and solve problems and a good platform to start with. And, you know, my, you know, advice to everybody or out there or just, you know, something to think about is that, you know, you, your your career will be a uh, a journey, not a, not a destination. Um, keep your eyes open. Some things may you know come out of it that you never expect. But I will say this: that having you know an electrical engineering degree or electrical and computer and systems engineering degree is just a great platform to branch off into other other disciplines, other parts of the business, and maybe things on a on a, on a broader scale. So keep your eyes open. That's awesome advice. Thank you so much. And then Dr. Galarza, since you've had such a long and robust career in the power industry, and I think that's one of those things that a lot of students don't come in immediately asking about. And so they, I think it's something that there could be more awareness of. As you look to the next five to 10 years when these students get out and start looking for jobs, what are, in your opinion, are some of the problems and new things that they can work on if they're thinking of joining the power industry? I think this is a great time for, for joining the industry because I have a very concentrated career. I, I do degree power system, but you can have a degree that has a minor in power system and be working in another industry. You might be even working for Tesla. Or, or for the Navy. The Navy is, you know, transitioning from nuclear to electrical in, in all electrical in, in a boat. And the same aviation, they are already trying that kind of thing. So the electrical grid, it is changing quite rapidly and in a way I never saw in my entire career. There are so many challenges. I particularly like challenges. And I particularly like when things are changing. They used to be a, a very conservative, slow industry. Things will move very slowly. Now, it's, if you compare with five years ago, it's like pandemonium. You have enormous powerful driving forces that are changing the industry. For example, you have aggression very aggressive institutional mandates regarding incorporation of renewals. So if you have a lot of wind coming into the grid, a lot of solar generation coming into the grid, there are a lot of things that might change. And there is an opportunity for working in very different areas that I never saw in my entire career. You might be working for a company that produce batteries now for the for electric power system. And, and as I said, the challenges are really, really big in what in what I do, for example, it impacts all the main three factors in the in the electrical grid, the design, the operation, and the planning. All of them are being uh, changed as, as we speak. And for me, at least in particular, that it is very, um, how to say, you, you will have a lot more choices today if you have a minor or major in power system engineering that I, I had when I started my career. When I started my career, it was like, okay, who builds generators, models, and things like that? And then who handles the grid? That's it. General Electric or Power Technologies? I went to Power Technologies. Now you have so many new technologies, and we don't even know what is the optimal use of the technology. So, as I said, there are challenges everywhere. If you like that, if you like to have the ability to say, okay, oh, maybe I do the grid and I investigate what is the impact of 
incorporated such a huge amount of wind and solar, renewable generation, or you say, no, I like something more cool. I'm gonna go and see if I can work for Tesla. Tesla has a great uh, partnership now with the industry, something I never imagined, because they're interested in knowing what are we doing with the batteries, you know? So it is a renewal. You can even see it in, in the in the. You can even see it in the in the academia too, because you can, you see positions of professor of, with some sort of power, engineering uh, concentration, that I have not seen in twenty years. It, so, I would say to think is a very exciting time, and there are so many more industries that are available for you if you do power systems. I will end it there, probably. Great, thank you. And then next um, for Dr. Kamenani, in both of the companies that you've worked for so far, um, something that was really stood out on your resume is how consistently everywhere you've worked, you've gotten promotions and gotten to have higher levels of responsibility, been involved on various committees. So can you share your experience of how your responsibilities progressed as you got promoted within a company and how it felt to have like your, I guess for lack of a better word, your rank change as you kind of moved up? Sure. Um, there's one piece of solid advice that my hiring manager at Global Foundries told me and I haven't forgotten till today is that um, whenever I found a gap or something was missing, um, not to just simply point out that gap, but to actually offer a solution or a path forward. And he clearly said that that shows initiative. Um, it shows the ability to increase one's scope of, you know, one's role that you're ready to take on more challenging opportunities and such. And so that's what I did. Um, I did that through my time at Global Foundries. And first I started with gaps or things that maybe could be optimized within my department or within my smaller sub teams. And then as I took on more and more responsibilities, um, uh, what my set projects were in things, once you kind of, you know, get used to your projects, you get like a nice cadence of things. So these new projects kind of kept me more excited and learning something new and had new challenges to offer. So once I was able to address these kind of bigger gaps within my department, then I took on more responsibilities and my exposure increased to more of that outside my department and eventually, you know, outside my full organization. Um, that's when I started actually leading company-wide task forces. So I had my sort of what I call my normal role within the packaging realm, working with you know internal teams, external vendors, working with customers and things. If there were issues and such, I'd be like the first one to raise my hand and say, hey, I really you know have some ideas about this. Can I get this sort of a task force? And by the time when I left, I think the end of 2018, um, I was leading global task forces. Um, and then I was uh, became actually the chief of staff for the CTO. So it gives you a lot more exposure and it gives you um, uh, opportunities to actually, you know, try new things because once you've been in maybe the same role for a year or two, things kind of come very natural. You become a bit comfortable. And then I realized that when I was comfortable, I wasn't learning enough. So when I had these challenges and I kind of raised my hands that, hey, I'd like to take this on, I grew technically. I grew into learning a little bit more about business side, a little bit more about strategy, about customers, at different teams outside of packaging and global foundries as well. And so I've always just kind of kept that as my mantra where it's if I see something that can be approved or I see a gap, then I take the opportunity to propose a solution and I don't shy away to kind of, you know, lead a group to find that path forward. And yes, it adds to my scope of, of my role, but it shows motivation. It gives the exposure and it's very helpful. I mean, um, to kind of show, you know, when we have annual reviews and things um, to kind of look at, hey, these were the goals, these are the projects you're supposed to be working on this year, but then to show, hey, I went above and beyond and I'm ready to take, take on new challenges. That's when the promotional cycle or uh, became pretty, it happened kind of as aggressively as I wanted it to. Um, and so that's kind of how I've um, ended up at Psy Quantum, um, where an opportunity arose and they needed somebody to lead the whole, you know, packaging department here. and. I raised my hand and said, yes, you know, I've done a few things, but, you know, I had to kind of learn about, you know, road mapping and budgeting and all these things kind of very quickly. And I just kind of threw myself into it and 
yeah, it's something new and it keeps me engaged and challenged. And I think that's what I like about it. So I'm already thinking about what my next kind of role is going to be in the next three to five years, where if I keep doing the same thing, I'm, I am fearful of becoming complacent and not learning. So what can I do? Are there any other gaps in the company that I can help fill? Whether that's leading more from the manufacturing side, is that leading more from the operation side? whatever it may be. So I kind of keep my eyes open and, you know, um, have very clear communication with my leadership as well on where I see myself, what skills I want to develop. So I think that's how it kind of just naturally led me to where I am today. And look forward to seeing where I'll go in the next, you know, years to come. Wonderful. I think there's a lot of really solid advice wrapped up in all that. So thank you for sharing. And then next up for Sam, while we were preparing everything for the panel, something you referenced as being really impactful to your time at RPI was your experience doing research with Dr. Carr. And I have students every year as freshmen who are interested in research. So can you tell us more about that experience and what impact, if any, it has on your work now that you're done with RPI and have moved on from research? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's had a, a, a huge impact. So I, I participated in um in research for seven semesters at rpi seven out of out of my eight um so i you know just in my freshman year um emailed a bunch of professors and eventually just looking for research and eventually found one that was looking for looking to fill a, a position for an undergrad um and so what i did is i ended up working with um a phd student who was you know working on his thesis at the time um, his thesis was in smart indoor climate management. Um, so like taking, you know, uh, uh, like climate preferences, humidity, temperature, all that um, from people throughout a building. And then he designed, you know, this algorithm that would, you know, take the, the thermal uh, characteristics of the building the space that they're all in and try to optimize um, the HVAC system to work in that space. So as an undergrad, um, I was basically just building the, the, the system that would take his algorithm and try to, uh, you know, manipulate different sensors and, and manipulate different control systems to, to uh, put his algorithm to use. Um, so that ended up going fairly, fairly far, um, as you can, I'm sure you can imagine with seven lasting seven semesters. Um, so we ended up, um, uh, the PhD student uh, uh, wrote a, you know, a published paper um, which I got to be named as an as a co-author in, which is you know huge for for an undergrad. Um, RPI, you know, is one of I think a very few places that that would give an undergrad the opportunity to to, to do something like that. Um, and then even further, we he went on to um, to take you know this this small team of of undergraduates plus plus himself um, and uh, sort of form a, a small company out of it. Um, so we ended up traveling to Washington, D.C. for a, a startups uh, demo day at the Capitol building. Um, spent some time at the Tech Valley Center of Gravity doing demos there. Um, and so, you know, the research just has, has just uh, it was a ton of experience in a, in a small period of time during school um, and just hugely valuable now because, I, you know, I was working on a team. I was building a, a you know, helping to build a distributed system. Um, that would take someone's, you know, design and, and put it to work. Um, so yeah, I think all aspects of it I continue to use, you know, in my in my job today. Um, but I, I can't recommend it enough. You know, the whole research experience at RPI um, and and what undergrads are are enabled to do here um, is is you know hugely impactful and looks obviously very good on your on your resume when you're going out and looking for internships and jobs great thank you so much and then for our two wonderful student panelists obviously we've heard about your internships and you both were successful in finding them so one thing i was hoping you could maybe talk about with the students is how did you get there so when you went to go apply or interview for these positions were there any specific things that stood out in terms of maybe experiences you'd had or skills that were on your resume or classes you mentioned that you found that companies or recruiters tended to ask about a lot? Um, so when I 
So the biggest thing I would suggest anyone is to start applying early. Uh, so it, I, in order to get the internship that I did, uh, I started applying at least a year early for the summer internship. I applied in June the previous year. So always apply early. And what really helped was um, having all the fundamental classes down in my resume because most uh, recruiters don't actually know which um, what classes are you taking in what year because they might not be familiar with the you know with RPI or what classes each student takes. So having them down and particularly what classes were they interested in was um, as a software engineer it was mostly data structures and intertouch algorithms. Those are two big classes because even the interview questions were majorly, majorly like based on those two classes. So any technical interview for any big company, be it Google, be it um, uh, be it uh, Verizon or any even Cisco, all three companies, they had um, they had questions that you would learn from in data structures or intro to algo. And um, if you're looking into more electrical engineering internships, questions from uh, COCO, which is Computer um, Components and Operations, which is basically digital logic, and also circuits, that really helped a lot for all my um, electrical engineering internships. And not just these core classes, also my projects from um, Intro to Engineering Design, which is a class many engineers had to take was a huge boost on my resume because I had it labeled as a project and any person I talked to always asked me what the project was about and I could label like I could talk about the team experience I could talk about how we came to design the product that we did so that was a huge boost on my resume so definitely those classes are things that make you shine among other candidates and I would strongly recommend once you take it to put it on organization. Yeah, I think it was computer organization and components, uh, as well as computer networking and operating systems. You know, a lot of them were targeted at like, you know, the bit level, you know, kind of constructs where, you know, how we can optimize those in hardware. And, uh, you know, kind of taking this with a slightly different angle. You know, in my experience, a lot of people, you know, believe and, and for good reason that software is kind of king. And, you know, software can do, you know, everything. And I think for decades, companies like Intel and AMD really were able to make this a reality because of, you know, consistently upgrading the speed of their CPUs following Moore's law. But now that that's, you know, starting to die down, I think hardware, you know, engineers really have an opportunity now to get into the field to build, you know, specifically, you know, basically, you know, integrated circuits that are specific for a single task which will really help companies like Amazon, Microsoft, and Facebook. So kind of getting back to the question, I would say the most helpful skills for me were just you know being able to see kind of where the future lies. And we have a lot of different digital design classes here. And you know if you're looking into hardware design, that's what I recommend taking. And for the first year, you're not gonna be taking very many of those, but in your upper class in years, finding an internship, as much hardware design experience as possible. So we, we offer classes to, you know, design uh, chips based on, you know, very large system integration. So yeah, that, that's the biggest thing I'd recommend. Taking classes that are specific to whatever you want to do. In my case, hardware design. Great, always good to have some advice from people who've been there. So for the next question, this one will be for our alumni because we have quite a diversity of experiences here. So I think you'll all bring some good perspectives. So some students start asking about graduate school as early as freshman year. So in your perspectives, um, if a student is thinking about that, what are some tips you'd have for them? How should they know? How would they start to think about what kind of degree might be the right choice, whether it's a master's or a PhD? when would be the right time, whether it's going straight from undergrad into their graduate program or poten potentially taking time off to work. So I know we've got a lot of different degrees here, so I think it'd be great if you could all just kind of share any grad school tips you have. Great. Here, I'll be happy to give you, give you my point of view. 
Um, and, you know, again, as I mentioned, I, I, I did get my master's degree in computer engineering and I did it through the work study program. And, and that was very helpful to me uh, when I was working at I IBM and, and you know, maybe, maybe less helpful to me as I went into the executive ranks, but, but still kind of gave me some bona fides uh, from a, you know, uh, different technical credentials. But I think the answer really depends on, and I look at it, is if you, if you kind of know now, if, if there's really a specific area that interests you and you want to dig deep and maybe go into research and, and really become a subject matter expert in a particular field, then that might be the, the, the uh, inflection point of, of saying, okay, yeah, I want to get this specific expertise because it will be more valuable to me having that master's degree with a specific concentration um, as I go into that. If, if you're someone like myself, I would say, I, I look at it as, okay, you know, I want to go on to engineering world. I want to have a, a, a meaningful job and, and you know, see where the world takes me, if you will. Um, I'd look at it as like, you have to look in terms of opportunity costs, right? So you can go right into uh, getting a master's degree, but I would, I would say, well, there's an opportunity cost there. You go get a job, you're making X amount of dollars that year. If you, and then if you're pursuing a master's degree, you're not making that amount of money and you're also spending money. And so there's a, there's a, there's a catch up game. And, and the reality is a lot of companies, you know, they do have work study programs. They do have certification programs where you can, can continue to grow your technical expertise. And so, so I really think it depends on, you know, where, you know, if you know specifically, gosh, I really want to be an expert in one, one field versus, okay, I've got my bachelor's. I want to go out to industry. I want to see, um, see what the different um, opportunities are. And then, and then maybe, you know, go from there. I'll, I'll try answering that one too. Um, so from talking to my internship managers and team members in my you know summers at IBM and such, I learned that there's so many different concentrations and different focus that you can have with an ECSC degree. And I really believe that RPI gave me a very solid foundation. Um, and I figured out what I didn't want to do, but there were certain things where I was kind of, okay, you know, I, I wanna try a bit more or delve a bit deeper into a certain topic. So that's where kind of grad school seemed like the right decision for me. Um, and one logical statement, like I, I agree with Diane that, you know, um, IBM in those days and a lot of the, like global foundries and things, they do offer these, um, you know, uh, uh, education programs where they kind of assist you with, you know, maybe you're taking weekend schooling or night schooling, get your master's or MBA or whatever it may be. Um, but then I heard also the other side of the, the, you know, um, the kind of thinking where, okay, you know, you're already used to living like a college student. <laughs> you're not used to like working and having this full paycheck. So if you're interested in getting your degree, focus on it truly, especially if, you know, with a master's, I think you can do it while you're working and um, kind of do it part-time with, especially if you want to go into a very research-focused degree or something like a PhD, you really have to kind of really put all your time and effort into it. Um, so that's where I decided that, you know, for me, it's made sense to go right after my bachelor's. And um, I think it's just, it just made sense to, because I was used to living like a college student. So it's perfect. Um, I also knew that when I wanted to, um, when I, when I would enter like the working environment, I want to be able to kind of share my expertise immediately and be able to jump into the problem solving. Of course, you have to kind of have this learning curve to understand how the company's functioning and things and kind of get familiar with your projects. But um, coming in with a graduate degree, especially at Global Foundries, gave me a position as a senior engineer versus like as a new college graduate, that would be more of an entry level engineer. So I was given project opportunities from the start. And actually that was the expectation that yes, there would be a learning curve, but eventually I'd be owning these projects and actually contributing very technically and making decisions from the onset. So having that um, advanced degree or having the graduate degrees from the beginning kind of gave me um, a step into the decision-making immediately, which was really helpful. Can I add something to that? Uh, I really agree with most that has been said. Um, I found that if you really know what you want, it makes the thing a little bit easier. But also, like Himani said, if you like to be working, there are many companies out there that will support your your 
your education, particularly the master level. But the, the other thing that I wanted to, to, to say is, for me at least, there was a huge difference between going to graduate school and doing a master and then continuing into a PhD. The moment I decided to go into a PhD, I got rid of a lot of work. I mean, opportunities for work. I could never work in a utility. I could never work. I can mention many companies. So the, and I wanted to work for the industry. I was not oriented totally to academics. So some people go into a PhD because they are very focused on research and academics, and some people not. So to me, there is a, the, the, the big difference is if you want to advance your degree, you know what you want. These days, having a, a, a graduate school and master degree is almost a must. Uh, but if I were to think about going into a PhD, it is a complete different career. It's not the same. It's not the continuation of a master's degree, and then you go deeper and deeper and deeper into a subject matter. Yes, you do go deeper and deeper and deeper, but at the same time, it has consequences in the working place. As I say, I the moment I decided, I knew. No, 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 no. I need to find a company that will accept me with my degree, that they will need my, somebody with a degree like mine. So it narrows down if you don't go to the academia directly, right? If you, if you are doing that because you just want to do research, then it's a little bit more simplified. You have to find a place. But if not, it could be a problem because you are getting rid of lots of working opportunities. And that's not the same with the master. The master actually opens for you many other opportunities because many people consider that to be a must these days. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so we've got about five minutes before we jump over the questions from any students who are watching. Um, and just in case people haven't seen, Kristen typed in the chat box, if there are any questions that you specifically want to ask some or all of our panelists, just go ahead and type it in the chat box and we will address them very shortly. So in the interest of trying to pick a question that's relatively concise so we don't go over, I think it would be great if maybe just as our last group question for all of our panelists, what is one thing you wish you knew your first year of college that you now know? And maybe why don't we start with our undergrads who haven't gotten to talk for a while? How about Matt to start? There we go, one second, let me. Uh, this was the question you said, one thing that you know we wish we knew when we got here? So, um, I would say the biggest thing that I wish that I knew right as I got here was, uh, you know, that it's fantastic to establish, you know, connections with the faculty. So, um, you know, it's kind of daunting when you first get here, you know, you know, class sizes going from like, you know, 20 to 30 people, you know, to having lectures of, you know, 350 people. And, you know, it can be kind of difficult to approach, you know, a professor when there's, you know, so many students, but um, you know, in, in my experience, having those connections with the faculty has been, you know, amazing for me, both, you know, professionally and, you know, personally, you know, through my projects. So I would say that is the single biggest thing is try your best. You know, if you have a professor who you really like or you're very interested in what they're teaching, a lot of them are really, really passionate about what they do. So it's fantastic to pick their brains about, you know, anything, you know, as long as they're interested. So. Great. How about Niranthi? What's something you wish you knew at the beginning? Kind of branching off from what Matt said, uh, I like. I think someone told this to me like sophomore year, and I wish I knew this freshman year, was that the worst anyone can get is a no. So therefore, don't always be afraid to ask. So don't be afraid to ask anything, be it um, networking with uh, employers, networking with alumni, or just asking a professor about some question or asking for help. The worst you can get is a no. So don't be afraid to ask for help. 
Awesome. And then let's hear from Sam. What's something you wish you knew during your first year? Um, yeah, I think I, I completely agree with um, with Matt's and mine. It's kind of similar. Um, but beyond just professors, I wish I had known at the time that making connections with your peers is often really going to be impactful in starting your career because your uh, many of your peers are not going to be um, graduating at the same time as you will enter the industry before you and w can give you, you know, advice that might be more targeted for someone like yourself that will just be starting out in the industry. Um, so if you join, you know, clubs or, or Greek life or anything like that, you'll oftentimes have these larger networks of alumni that may have just graduated or have been out for a while um, that are really, really great resources um, for finding jobs and just you know, asking questions and getting career support. Um, so yeah, just, uh, you know, any connection you can make with with an RPI alumni, whether it's, or, or non-alumni, it's, it's your peer or graduated peer or, um, yeah, professor as well, um, is so valuable and uh, really important to, to do when you're an undergrad. Great, and how about Diane next? Sure. Well, the one thing I wish I had learned uh, coming into college, and of course I made the same mistake all the way through college, and I didn't figure it out till after I was out, was just the simple of taking care of yourself. I, I was the typical um, study, 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 too busy to exercise, too busy to think about what I was putting in my mouth, too busy to enjoy the things that I'd like to do. I play my violin. No, it was work, 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 work. And, and I really didn't have a, a, a good sense of the appreciation for the mind body connection and and what you know the healthy mind uh, healthy mind and a healthy body right and so you know I, I went through sleep deprivation just working working like a dog not looking at what i was putting in my mouth and finally when i started working i said you know what actually when i get sleep and i eat right and i do things that balance out the work aspect of things i'm actually more productive i'm actually more interesting i'm actually more fun and I feel I feel better about everything. And so my my point here is I'm sure there's a lot of people in our audience that have the same thing that are you know, kind of workaholics, work all the time. But let me tell you that if you you know make room in your life to take care of yourself, um, the end product is going to pay dividends. You'll be better from the get go. So everybody get your get your sleep and eat right. Great. How about Hamani? Um, I think I'll build upon what Diane said. Um, make sure you get that well-rounded experience as well. You know, um, when we're coming from high school, the focus is on you know, like your GPA and all these activities and really, you know, boosting your resume or your application for, uh, you know, college. But once you're here, yes, grades and things are important. Um, get your sleep, you know, eat well and things, but make sure you take part in different activities. So the, the plethora of people that you're going to meet yeah, in RPI are just going to be folks from all different walks of life, from all different, um, you know, countries, states, cities, you name it. So, you know, get to know them in whether it's a social club, whether it's, you know, some technical, you know, honor society, whatever it may be. If you're doing some research work, if you want to join some cultural group, I mean, just get exposed to different viewpoints, because when you enter industry, or even if you go to grad school, you're going to have to learn to work with folks that have very different viewpoints that maybe um, you have to work through different forms of communication, you have to work through different mindsets because they come from different areas of the states or different parts of the world. So um, just don't be afraid to connect with people. And a lot of those uh, relationships, you know, as mentioned earlier, it's wonderful to have them for networking, but then quite a few of them, you know, if you're investing the time and the effort, that you turn into really great friendships. Um, and so I have quite a few of those really good friends that, you know, we may not be able to keep in touch all the time, but now that we're spread out, you know, globally, it's nice to just call them up and see what they're doing, how they're doing, or, and so build that network and just get these experiences because what you're going to be offered at RPI once you enter Warforks and you kind of focus your efforts and things, you may kind of be not limiting yourself in a box, but just the exposure you have here. Um, it's hard to find that everywhere else in life. Great. And then last but not least, before we turn it over to our student questions, Dr. Galarza, was there anything you wish you knew when you started college? Well, one of them, Diane, described perfectly. I just work, work, work. 
the, the first two years of my bachelor's degree, the only thing I can tell about my bachelor's degree that could be somehow cool is that I play volleyball in the varsity team. That's it. After that, it was work, 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 work. And the other thing that I now think in retrospect I would have changed is that I understand you need to develop math, science skills to become a good engineer. But I was too much of a hardcore on that. I would have added something else. I would have added English literature, I don't know, something more in the humanities, something in the communication, something, something that will make me a more rounded individual because then you go, you go to the working place. It's not all science as in engineering. You need all of those skills too. And if you got a little time or to develop some of it, during your staying there in, in in college, you should take advantage of it. I I took a quick look of the 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 courses that you can take in RPI today. I was so glad to find that you can take humanities, art as electives. You know what I mean? And that is something I did not do until I was way into graduate school. Anyway, that's my story. Great. It's always it's always nice to have some reinforcement that the gen eds can still do you good. So with that being said, um, so far we just have one student question. So again, sidebar for students, if you want to ask something, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, but for anybody who on the panel who would like to answer, someone asked, are there any specific minors you would strongly recommend for the ECSE industry? And I know some of you have touched on different things you found impactful. So even if it's not a minor, maybe we can branch that out too. Are there any specific courses that might not necessarily be in their template, but you think really would be beneficial? So uh, if anyone wants to talk, just put up a hand and I'll cry. call. Anybody? I'll try it. Um, so Go for it. I think if um, you're interested in like semiconductor or chip fabrication or, you know, this hardware side of things, um, microelectronics, having that as a concentration was pretty helpful. Um, I'm not sure if that is still offered as one. I, I had it in like, you know, the early 2000s, but um, it was really nice to be able to kind of tie the software side, but really focus on the hardware as a concentration. And then, you know, VLSI design and things like this was really nice um, as part of that course package. Can I say something? Uh, what I found lately in particular is that we are, we have so much information, we have so many changes going on that it is not just one, one thing, you know, power engineering, whatever. Uh, and this is an extension of what I just said. Uh, I will try to take something that it is in other, even in other, if, it, if they let me. Um, in other schools or whatever, we are bombarded with data. So I probably will take a course in big data. I, I would have taken more courses in computer science because what I took then, it is minimal today because we are all exposed to that. Um, data visualization is so important in what I do. There are courses that you can take on that too. So that's, that's what I wanted to to add to what I just said before. And I'll, I'll just take um, one other spin on that. And again, this, what I'm about to say really doesn't apply if you're looking to go um, very deep into a research or, or become a subject matter expert, but it gets back to more of the business end of things, right? So if you plan on going out into, into industry at, and you want to um, either become a, um, go up the technical chain, if you will, and man, you know, manage engineers and, and be in the technical side, or if you branch off like I did and go into the business side, then having an under, there's, there's an intersection of engineering meets business somewhere along the way. And so I would say that having a good background in economics and maybe some business courses in a concentration is certainly going to help round out, I'll call it, you know, technical acumen and in terms of what are other considerations as you go forward. Because again, as, as you go through your career, you, you can, 
always design the best best widget, but business factors come into play. So I think having a business, um, some level of business knowledge is very beneficial. I just had a, a minor thing to add too. Sure. Um, I think we focus a lot on the technical or as like uh, Diana suggested, the business side, which is wonderful to venture into. The focus on the communication as well. I think there were a few electives that I was able to take and I took one where it was based on, I think, like speech and written skills and things. And that was very helpful because no matter what role I'm doing, I've been doing since I graduated, knowing how to cater to the audience that I'm speaking to, whether it's executives or to, you know, your peers or to folks that report to you, whether it's internal, external, how to be able to communicate in a clear, concise manner is super helpful. And I think that course is very memorable because I, I believe the professor actually would count our number of like ums and uhs and things. So, you know, it'd make us a little, we turned it into kind of a little joke, but um, communication is something that you can uh, never have enough of. So if there's anything like that, that, you know, RP is offering, if you have, uh, can take as an elective, I would highly suggest it. Awesome. And then we have just two minutes left. So I think this last student question will be our last question. Um, so it sounds like this one is very much tailored to Sam. So what are some tips you have for looking for and applying to research opportunities at RPI? Um, so this may be different from when I uh, was looking for research in like 2014, 2015, but even I think the, the uh, advice still applies. Um, just if you're just looking for general research or even you know research research in a in a specific uh, field, um, really it's just it's just talking to professors. Um, at least for me, I, I spent a lot of time my freshman year um, reaching out to professors, whether it was via email or finding their office hours at some point, um, you know something like that, um, and just trying to just introduce myself asking if they had research opportunities, you know, for undergrads, um, telling them what I was interested in and what I had done before. Um, uh, I don't know if it's gotten more formalized now, um, but, you know, just going back to that, like making connections and, and uh, communication, I think that's, that's the biggest thing is even, even your advisor, if you, you know, just reach out to them and ask, do you know anyone, do you know any, any fellow professors who are looking for an undergraduate? Uh, assistant in, in any research, you know, under your PhD students, um, anything like that. Um, yeah, just <laughs> if it's if it's spam emailing professors, then, um, you know, that's what it can take sometimes. But um, yeah, just communicating with with professors and faculty um, and sometimes, you know, PhD students, if you happen to know them. Great. Well, it is 730, so Kristen will just hop on shortly to close us out. But I just want to take a moment to thank all of our panelists for spending the evening with us and sharing some wisdom. I, I learned a lot. And I them. So I'm really hoping you all enjoyed and felt like you got some valuable lessons out of this. So over to you, Kristen. Hey, Kara. Thank you. And yes, I obviously deeply, deeply agree with everything that Kara just said. Um, we are so grateful to those of you who came to talk to us tonight. And of course, we're very excited for those of you who came to take advantage of industry hour tonight. Um, just a reminder, next week is going to be environmental engineering. Um, so that'll kind of be taking a spin back to what we did last week with civil engineering. Um, tomorrow, I will be sending out an email that has um, uh, information that will help you from tonight. So it'll be major uh, major template. It'll be um, the, a link to where this video will be recorded if you want to go back and listen to a part again. Um, if you have additional questions, you know this all sinks in overnight and you realize that there was something you wanted to ask the panelists, you can always reach out to me and I'll put my email in the chat um, and I can, I can help you connect or, and this obviously comes with zero pressure to our panelists if any of them want to throw their email in the chat room. Um, they're more than welcome to do so. Um, but thank you so much. Um, I'm going to hang out for just a minute. And anyone else can go if anyone has any questions.